Well, good evening, everyone, and thank you for attending tonight's event with Dr. Sharon Hausman Cohen on Precision Health Genomics as part of Clinical Decision Making. Before I introduce our moderator tonight, I wanted to briefly mention some upcoming events for ACAMP. We will be hosting a virtual chelation advanced program August 21st with registration opening in the next few days. And then our next webinar will be at the end of this month with Ryan Smith on an introduction to epigenetic myelolation. And we will send more information on these upcoming events in tonight's recording. Our moderator tonight is Dr. Avi Herskowitz. Dr. Herskowitz is the president of ACAM, an international leader and educator in the field of personalized precision and integrative medicine. Thank you, Katie. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us today. This is going to be a spectacular hour, I assure you. It's my pleasure to introduce Sharon Hausman Cohen. I'm not going to read all the words here, but I will tell you that she's the co-founder, chief scientific and medical director of Intellix DNA. She and her co-founder, Carol Billich, saw the need for actionable, easy to use science-based genomics tools for medical doctors and developed what is now called IntelliX DNA. We got to know Sharon uh, some number of months ago and, and this led to this particular webinar today, which I'm super excited about. She received in background a master's degree and medical degree from Harvard and she is board certified in family medicine and is a fellow of the American Board of Integrative and Holistic Medicine in addition to other integrative medicine specialty boards. She has practiced full spectrum family medicine for over 20 years. And as you will see in the next hour, she's a brilliant integrator of genomics and functional medicine. Sharon, it's uh, yours now. So tonight we're gonna to talk about genomics and how a patient's genome can be used to improve medical decision-making. What I'm gonna do is I'm going to use some different vignettes or some short cases in order to explain this. Intellix DNA is a clinical decision support tool. And so in being a clinical decision support tool, it doesn't tell you what to do for the patient, but it gives you insight into the root causes of a patient's genomics and what those different genes do so that you, as well as different ideas for potential intervention strategies. And so, by allowing you to understand the root causes, you can make more personalized and better medical decision-making. A lot of people think that genomics really is not there yet and that it's still the future of medicine, but we would have many thousands of patients across the country and hundreds of physicians that would say, no, genomics is the present. And I strongly think that by the end of this talk, you will hopefully agree. Because we have people here tonight that are at various levels of their genomic knowledge, I'm just gonna spend about three minutes updating everyone and bringing everyone up to speed as to what your genome is and what genomic medicine really entails. So your genome is your whole collection of your DNA. I tell my patients it's your user manual or it's your code to how your body functions because inside your genome is the code for everything that makes you you. When we talk about genomics, we often talk about SNPs, not 100% of the time. There are some other things that fall into genomic medicine, but a SNP stands for a single nucleotide polymorphism. And as you'll remember, DNA is made up of these building blocks, the different nucleotides, the A, the T, the G, the C, and you have about 3 billion nucleotides in your DNA. Now about once every 100 nucleotides, there's little reading errors, and it depends on the person when you have these. But again, most people have them, have about 3 million of them in their genome. And these slight little differences where you have these slight substitutions in your DNA are called single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs. These slight differences are what make us unique. They're variants. So the difference between blue eyes and brown eyes is due to a SNP. And while those SNPs are cosmetic, many, many SNPs really affect our proteins and our coding genome on a very significant level. Not enough to be pathogenic or disease causing. So a pathogenic SNP would be something like Tay-Sachs. And most pathogenic gene variants are not just single nucleotide polymorphisms. There are some that are. 
but we're not going to talk about pathogenic ones tonight that cause a disease. Instead, we're going to look at common SNPs. So common SNPs are changes that occur in anywhere from 1% to 50% of the population that relate to the different proteins that our DNA codes for. Things like the transporters for vitamins and minerals, the DNA code for synthesizing different enzymes and hormones relating to how you transport thyroid hormone or create T4 to T3, all the hormones of estrogen and testosterone and so, so many. The repair factors that allow for tissue remodeling and DNA repair, the cytokines that are involved in cytokine storm, signaling inflammation, stopping inflammation, all the neurotransmitters needed for mood and memory, and all of the detox and cleanup molecules have various SNPs inside those genes that can affect whether or not you are good at removing mercury, whether or not you're good at transporting different vitamins, et cetera, or whether you make more inflammation or less. So again, the way I explain it to my patient is SNPs are these single letter changes, kind of like typos in your DNA, and sometimes, just like a typo or a little bit of a change in a recipe, they have no effect at all. So if you think about the difference of changing the word bake to broil in a recipe, that's a big deal. But blend to stir is not a big deal. So we want to look at the SNPs that actually do have clinical significance. So for example, a SNP can be something like a change in how quickly you metabolize B12. There's a SNP in a gene called Sybil. And that particular gene, if you have it, and it's in about 4% of the population, you need tremendously higher amounts of B12 in order to maintain your levels because you're constantly chewing it up. And that's important for so many things because of course B12 is a cofactor for many different reactions in your brain and throughout your body. Now, genomics was popularized by direct-to-consumer products, but what does a physician do? What would you do with 100 pages that look like this? Can you tell from this page which of these genes is associated with four times the risk of sensory neural hearing loss? Which of these is associated with increased risk of stroke or heart disease? Which of these is associated with ADHD? Which ones do you intervene with with B12? So if you have patients that have come to you, I am sure with genomics, I'm sure they brought you things that look like this and say, hey doc, can you help me use my genomics? And what we have to say is, I have no way of interpreting this because you would have to have an amazing photographic memory to be able to go through hundreds of patients with these kinds of SNPs and know what gene did what. Or how do you intervene or make recommendations based on this? This is also from a direct to consumer product and using an interpretation tool. And it says these SNPs are related, circled in the bottom, to clotting factors, coronary artery disease, thromboembolism, blood clots, DVTs, ischemic stroke, fetal loss, and autism. But how would you know which of these SNPs are more significant? Some of these have four or five times the risk of blood clots, and some have 1.1 times the risk. And how would you know which ones you address with fibrinolytics and which ones with antiplatelet? Again, you can't from this kind of a tool. And so what happened is in our practice, and I have a, a precision medical practice called Resilient Health with my co-founder, Carol, and we had patients bringing us our genomics and saying, can you use this to help prevent Alzheimer's, heart disease, all kinds of things, Parkinson's, whatever ran in their family. And so we started looking into genomic tools for clinicians and found that there really wasn't one for those of us that are integrative or functional medicine trained that are dedicated to evidence-based medicine that wanted to use genomics in a way where we felt like we were holding genomics to the same kind of standard we would hold any other medical information. And so we developed genomics in the format that's called a clinical decision support tool. The thing about a clinical decision support tool is it takes that medicine principle that we have for any other kind of a lab test. You don't order a lab test if you don't know what you're gonna do with it. And the same thing is true with genomics. Don't order genomics if you don't know what you're gonna do with it. But when you use a genomic clinical decision support tool, the goal is that you not only identify what SNPs or variants you have that can contribute to a patient not feeling well, but also what you can recommend to the patient to intervene so that you can overcome this root cause. Before we go into some case studies, I just want to take 30 seconds to pause 
and say, think about the fact that when many of our parents were young, so in 1953, my dad was a teenager, maybe a young man, and that's when the DNA helix was discovered by Crick and Watson. 2003, well after I was a parent and a physician, the whole genome was sequenced and the human genome was sequenced at a price tag of $2.7 billion. And now in 2021, this technology is accessible so that you can use it to optimize your health and your patient's health. And that's really, to me, pretty amazing. So let's get started with some case studies using a one SNP, SNP example. I generally don't like to talk about one SNP in isolation, but I'm going to do this as a warm up. But you're going to see as we go deeper, you can't really say this is the Alzheimer's SNP or this is the cardiac SNP because it's just not like that. There's dozens of SNPs that contribute to each of these chronic diseases. Chronic disease is not a genetic disease where you get it from your parents and it's, you know, you either get it or you don't. There's many, many pieces that contribute. But just to get started, we're going to talk about COMT, which is catecholamine methyltransferase. And it is basically the gene that codes for the enzyme that breaks down adrenaline, norepinephrine, and to a lesser extent, dopamine. When you have too much adrenaline, it triggers a fight or flight response. That leads to high cortisol. So this gene is very involved in stress and anxiety. But why? Well, because the gene makes it so that it takes you three to four times longer to break down that cortisol. So when you have this gene, and I actually do have two copies of this CompT SNP, what happens is you get something told to you and you're a little upset over it. Maybe it's a phone call with a relative or maybe something that happens at work. And the person who has a, a normal, you know, quick acting ability to remove their adrenaline, 10 minutes later, they're fine. For people who are too compti, they hold on to it because the adrenaline stays high, that triggers more cortisol, and they can like either feel like they want to kill someone or they still 10, 15, 20 minutes later can still feel the tension from that event. So that's not necessarily a great thing, but genes aren't bad or good. And that's why I chose this one to start with because many of you may have two compti. In fact, I was speaking at a conference and afterwards a number of us went out, that was in the pre-COVID days when you could do that. And many of us had other people from our office or, or spouses with us. All of the speakers had two comp tea, none of the accompanying people did. So comp tea is often found in high achievers. So comp tea is not necessarily a bad SNP. Again, I suspect that many of you as physicians have this because that high adrenaline makes you a high achiever. It makes you able to work longer hours. It's great for succeeding during residency. It makes you have faster cognitive processing, maybe even talking a little faster. But what about that high stress and cortisol that the COMP-T results in? That's not so great because high cortisol and high stress can increase the risk of acute coronary syndrome. So the same SNP, it's not good or bad, increases the risk of stress, increases the risk of having a heart attack, 1.7 times the risk when you have two copies. If you're out you know, running and you, you have that kind of a stress event um, or if you just have had an argument, it also can have a risk of almost threefold if you also have homocysteine elevation. And so the SNP is really about having knowledge. If you know that somebody is a slow metabolizer of adrenaline, you as a physician can then make targeted recommendations. What kind of recommendations? Well, one option for COMPT is ashwagandha. Ashwagandha is an amazing herb for people of high cortisol because it decreases the cortisol levels 24%. In a study looking at perceived stress scores, it had a 47% reduction in perceived stress scores, as well as an over 60% reduction in anxiety and depression scores in that same study. And it's very safe, has other benefits, in terms of improving memory, libido, hair loss. And in a 2020 paper that was released last year, it was also shown to improve athleticism and VO2 max, and that may help with a cardiac standpoint. We know you can also recommend meditation and yoga to help lower cortisol and help with cognition. But one of the things about understanding genomics and being a precision medicine practice is we wanna give our patients choices, lifestyle, diet, supplementation, and sometimes medicine. 
So you can use this with any field. You can use genomics to uncover root causes of obesity, macular degeneration, osteoporosis, any disease that you can name, you can look and research the genomics. But for tonight, I'm going to look at three chronic diseases that are multifactorial and give you a couple of examples from these three diseases, cardiac disease, diabetes, and Alzheimer's. And then I'm gonna do a short case that relates to anxiety as well. And I think that all these cases will show you some of the root causes. Now, I'm only gonna show you one or two in each of the cases as illustrations, but know that, for example, in cardiac disease, there are SNPs that relate to clotting cascade and tissue plasminogen activator. There are SNPs relating to calcification, blood flow, inflammation. For diabetes, there's SNPs relating to incretin levels, insulin regulating channels, mitochondria, melatonin receptors, and so on and so forth. And in Alzheimer's, the list goes on and on as well. SNPs that relate not only APOE4, but SNPs that relate to neurodegeneration and inflammation, mitochondria, even detox hormones, vitamins. Again, things that I suspect are not a big surprise to you as an integrative or functional medicine practitioner. Let's take a closer look though, so you can kind of see how this works. So these are true cases. This is Donald. Of course, the names and pictures have been changed for patient privacy. He is an active male who came to my practice and I have a, a concierge practice for an annual executive physical. He's doing everything right, but he has a strong family history of heart disease. And as I'm talking to him about his exercise habits, he tells me, well, I used to run six miles four times a week, but I'm only running about three miles now. And so I said, well, why? And he said, well, around mile three, my, my left shoulder will start to hurt. And of course, that was a big red flag. I sent him for a stress test. It was normal. But as you guys know, a stress test is 11 minutes on a treadmill. This guy's an avid runner. We had just gotten his genomics back. And his genomics though, showed him to have six of the top 10 genomic risk factors for heart disease, including multiple ones that more than doubled his risk. And one of these we could have identified with labs, something that contributed to high cholesterol, but many of these we could not have identified. We actually also could have identified his high, his tendency towards high LPA. But I spoke with his cardiologist who I have a good rapport with, and we decided that given his history and his genomics to do a cardiac cath, I didn't do it, of course, the cardiologist did. And the cardiac cath showed serious heart disease. By the way, his anesthesia panel was also really helpful, but I don't have time for that tonight. But in his cardiac cath, it showed three vessel disease, including that widow maker. And so he had triple bypass, which was successful. And now Donald comes back and says, I really wanna understand those genomics that we didn't have time to fully go into so I can focus on prevention, because he's still a young man. So first he had a, a, a SNP that affected cardiac risk because of clot formation. And many of you guys, I'm sure every single one of you has ordered an LPA, whether it's been on a Berkeley or a, you know, a, a Cleveland heart panel. And the question is, do you know what LPA does? So LPA inhibits clot breakdown via the, by affecting tissue plasminogen activation levels. So when you have a clot, you get a bigger clot, bigger heart attack. In addition to LPA, Donald also had SNPs in, again, many pathways, but I'm gonna highlight a couple of these. I'm gonna highlight his CDKN2A, which used to be called ANRIL. There's another name for it that they use in the bale and donine. I think it's the 9P21. And this is a, relates to calcification and dramatically increases the risk of angina and sudden cardiac death. And then we're also gonna look at the nitric oxide pathway a little. He also had something called ICAM that affects bone cell formation and inflammation. But let's look at that calcification pathway. So CDK N2A causes higher levels of something called osteoprotegrin, which affects the bones, but it also causes problems where you have calcification in the arteries of the heart. And so what happens is if you look at vitamin K2 studies, you can dramatically decrease calcification of the heart by giving vitamin K2. And so in this study, you will see that aortic calcification levels with vitamin K2 went down 
by about 40%. Cardiac and all-cause mortality went also down by 40 to 50%. And so this was not a genomically targeted study. But when you know that somebody has higher risk of putting more calcium into their arteries, then that makes it even more the reason to make sure they're on vitamin K2 to address that. You can also address this pathway with ACE inhibitors. It's on matrix GLA that it also affects, that affects the cardiac calcification. What about nitric oxide? So you guys know, of course, that nitric oxide allows you to open up arteries, and so it affects the amount of blood flow to the heart, but more, it also relates to oxidized LDL. And when you don't have enough nitric oxide or NOS, you get more nitric oxide synthase, you get more oxidized LDL, which increases the risk of clot formation, and you also get stickier platelets. So what can we do about that? Well, we think again about the baseline etiology and what's going on. Just so you know, nitric oxide is a SNP involved in blood flow, and it's important for other blood vessels as well. So NOS SNPs can increase the risk of erectile dysfunction. So that's why we kind of talk about that early erectile dysfunction is a cardiac risk marker, because again, it's generally caused by NOS3 SNPs. But again, what can we do about it? So in the Intellix DNA reports, we talk about medicines that can work on this pathway, but also food and supplements. So uh, leafy greens and uh, high nitric oxide producing foods like beets can help, but there also was a study using pycnogenol and arginine that was shown to help with erectile dysfunction, and then separate studies showing that again, pycnogenol and arginine affect NOS production. So, Again, you try to use the genomics to understand the root cause, and then you use diet, lifestyle, supplementation, and sometimes medicines to give your patients targeted prevention or intervention advice. Let's look at diabetes. So this is a scatter plot where everything above this line that you see here is a SNP or a gene variant that's been associated with diabetes. The ones way high at the top, TCF7L2, is the gene variant most associated with diabetes? In fact, if you order a 23andMe report, your diabetes report is only this SNP. But you can see there's a lot of other SNPs because anything above the line that is considered significant that have high significance. So when we look at diabetes-associated SNPs, we look at any of them that have at least a 20% increase in risk and that we know what the gene does. So we can say, here's the gene function, what can we do about it and give suggestions for potential interventions? So this case is Bella, a 38-year-old mother of three. She is a writer. She has a hemoglobin A1C of 5.9, but no super strong family history of diabetes. She has grandparents, but again, she's still young with diabetes, but she wants to be proactive. She has read that it is better to have a hemoglobin A1C of less than 5.5, and wants to again achieve that. She does exercise, not intensely, but she runs a few times a week with friends, about three times a week, a few miles each time. She eats fairly well, but does tend to grab things on the go. Has a family history of some heart disease and some dementia and some osteoporosis. So let's take a look at some of the blood sugar SNPs that relate. And again, we're just gonna kind of jump into a couple of these. Some of these are mitochondrial, some of these are incretin related, some of these are melatonin related, and she had some other ones as well that affected a few other channels and such. One of my favorite ones to talk about is TCF7L2. And the reason I like that is we know exactly what it does. It codes for incretin. And again, when I was in medical school, we didn't really talk about incretin, we didn't talk about the incretin mimetics, but incretin of course is the signal that your stomach releases in response to incoming carbohydrates to let the pancreas know that it's time to release insulin. Each of these gene SNPs, so if you have one, it goes down by 30%. If you have two, it goes down by 60%, decreases that release of incretin. So what do you, uh, and you can see in this study that if you have a variant in this pathway, if you have a T, you're going to have if you look at the area under the curve in CC, which would be the wild type, you get a lot more release of insulin in response to your food because you have that incretin compared to if you have either one or two of the T variants. They had to lump them both together because two copies of T was not in enough of the study population. It was only in 8% 
of the population. But okay, so you know that your patient has this. What can you tell them to do other than you can tell them to take an incretin mimetic. You can tell them that they're not going to respond to something like Genuvia because with Genuvia, when you use something that's a, a DPP-4 inhibitor, you're saying, let's break down, let's affect the degradation pathway for incretin and not break down the incretin. Well, if the issue is that you don't have enough incretin, it's not going to work very well, and that's been studied. But you can also, on a proactive level, give them some suggestions. For example, and again, all of these potential interventions we put in our Intellix DNA report right next to the gene and the gene function, whey protein stimulates incretin. And in fact, whey protein given before a high glycemic index breakfast can increase incretin levels 141 to 300%. It can increase the insulin levels then by 105%. So that would be a good choice for somebody who has low insulin due to TCF7L2. A high protein breakfast with whey also helps to keep blood sugar levels lower for the next meal. So we told Bella, if you're grabbing a breakfast bar, let's have it be a low sugar one that also has at least some whey protein in it. Or if you're making yourself a smoothie, let's throw some whey protein in it. We also taught her about Gymnana Silvestra. Gymnana Silvestra is something that she now uses as needed. She lives in Texas, and if you, she's going out for Mexican food and can't resist the chips or the tortillas, she can take a Gymnana Silvestra beforehand and that can also help with incretin, but also helps to regenerate and keep pancreatic cells healthy. It also interestingly decreases the responsiveness of the receptors in the mouth to sugar. So she now doesn't have quite as many carb and sugar cravings because she's been using this. We also talked to her about American ginseng and I've used this in quite a few of my patients, but this I tend to use a little bit more in the people who are trying to lose weight, and that really wasn't Bella's concern. So there's lots of options, and that is what we want to present to you as a physician when you're looking at genomics so that you can make the right choice with your patient. She also had a PPAR pathway, and the PPAR pathway may sound familiar to you because we used to use a fair amount of Actos and Avandia, and those all work on the PPAR pathway. And so people who have PPAR GC1A SNPs, they do do better with PPAR agents as one of the options. But did you ever wonder, well, like what really are they doing? What does that PPAR pathway mean? Well, with genomics, and this is actually not from our physician report. Our physician report gives a lot more information. Um, this is from our patient version. But with genomics, you'll learn that. So the PPAR pathways relate to mitochondrial biogenesis. Mitochondria are important in oxidative stress, but also in beta cell function and in blood sugar and maintaining a healthy blood sugar. So knowing that she had mitochondrial issues, we could then give her suggestions for improving her mitochondria. Things like exercising. Now we can't really give her a cold exposure recommendation except for this year in February when we had nine inches of snow. Um, but we can talk to her about exercise. We can talk to her about intermittent fasting, later breakfast, et cetera. We could talk to her about mitochondrial supplements, CoQ10, acetyl L-carnitine, things like that. We also could talk to her about a low inflammatory diet as a low inflammatory diet helps with PPAR. Let me do kind of a quick jump into cognition because that's another really hot topic. Many individuals start to notice cognitive changes in their 40s, and I'm sure that many of you guys have had patients coming to you a little skittish, 45, 50, and going, you know, I can tell my memory is not as good as it used to be. And the classic thing is we think of APOE4, but this patient, Rachel, was a 48-year-old professor who came in with concerns, and she knew she didn't have APOE4 because she had done her 23andMe. But she did have some family history of grandparents with dementia in their 80s and is starting to notice worsening cognition in her father who had bypass in his 50s. So Rachel, we had to kind of use the genomics kind of as a discovery process for clues. She did have a combination that's fairly common of MTHFR and IL-6 that does increase the risk of Alzheimer's, but it also increases the risk of vascular dementia. And I'll tell you that we now take care of her father and it's clearly vascular dementia in him. But once we knew this, we could then address the MTHFR and the interleukin-6. 
We can address it methylfolate for MTHFR, and there's lots of anti-inflammatories that work on IL-6. But that's too common of a combination, so we knew that wasn't enough, so we kept looking. Well, Rachel also had a haplotype, which is a group of SNPs, that is only found in about 4% of the population, and it's in the BDNF pathway. And if I was in a live audience, I'd say, how many of you guys have heard of BDNF? And I think a lot of you probably would raise your hand. But what you might not realize is that this BDNF, or this brain-derived neurotropic factor, is a fertilizer for the brain that is in a precursor form naturally, and that the pre-BDNF form, or pro-BDNF as it's called, is not synaptogenic. It's actually synaptoclastic. You don't want to keep too much in that pro form. And this SNP made it so she was keeping it in the pro form and not converting it to the active form. Again, only in 4% of the population, but this combination gives her 2.7 times the risk of Alzheimer's. That is almost as significant as having an APOE4. We talked to her about foods. And so the diet for Rachel is different than the diet for other people. For her, we wanted a high butyrate diet because that's been shown to increase BDNF. Green coffee bean extract, milk thistle, there's lots of things that can increase BDNF. But we really stressed for her that high intensity exercise really needs to be part of her regular routine because that not only improves BDNF, but improves cognition. Again, I don't wanna go into all of her different pathways, but she had problems with less ability to synthesize choline, some tremendous inflammatory pathways that in combination gave her six times the risk of having premature cognitive decline that were easy to address with things that affect inflammation, things like sulforaphane, things like curcumin. So we had lots to talk about. She had estrogen receptor pathways. She even had problems with converting thyroid hormone to its free form. So lots of things that we could talk about. And she did extremely well and is not having any word finding or any problems anymore. The last quick study, so we still have 10 minutes at the end for hopefully questions, is Grace. Grace is an oncology nurse. She has been one for 30 years and she's now going through menopause and comes in complaining of more insomnia, more kind of stress and a little bit more anxiety. She is a very hardworking person, pays very close attention to details, has a family history of some anxiety and her daughter was recently treated for OCD. So the reason I wanted to highlight Grace's genomics for an anxiety case is when I classically think about anxiety, or if I were to ask you, what do you think is the most contributing factor to anxiety? Most physicians will say probably serotonin pathways, and they are. The serotonin pathways, the serotonin receptors are extremely important, especially in cases where you see mixed anxiety and depression. But Grace didn't have any problems with her serotonin pathways. It was a completely different etiology and one that we would have never gotten to by just trial and error medicine, I don't think, if we hadn't had her genomics. She had a pathway called NPSR1 that we'll talk about, a thyroid-related pathway, and some estrogen-related pathways as three of her key contributing factors. So NPSR1 is not a pathway that you guys are likely to have heard of but it relates to orexin levels. And so again, if you think about orexin, orexin is the anti-sleep hormone. It was what makes us feel more awake. So that drug Belsamra that's for insomnia, it raises orexin. So GABA helps us feel sleepy, orexin helps us feel awake. Orexin also stimulates histamine. Antihistamines help us feel sleepy, histamine makes you feel more awake. Histamine also can cause flushing. So the fact that Grace had high orexin and high histamine really fit because she had a gene that made her have much higher responses to normal stress, releasing 10 times the amount of these neurotransmitters. That's why when she would get panicky, she actually didn't like wearing the V-neck scrubs because she knew her chest would get red and she would feel anxious under stress. Well, if you think about coffee, one cup of coffee could be good, 10 not so great. It's the same thing with the protein made by the NPSR1. Orexin's good, it helps you feel awake, but too much of it can be problematic. So we were able to help Grace reduce her anxiety and flushing and insomnia by talking to her about things that lower histamine release, like pycnogenol and quercetin and vitamin C. Um, she could use antihistamines if she wants, 
but we also could lower her orexin levels with luteolin. Also, melatonin can have some effects on that. And we would have had, again, no way of knowing that without her genomics. She also had an estrogen receptor variant that is in the estrogen receptor that's really meant to calm down the estrogen pathways and make them anti-inflammatory. So estrogen, you can come and listen to, we have tons of educational materials and I have a whole video about estrogen and ESR1 and ESR2, but ESR1 is what caused the fibroids and the endometriosis and ESR2 is what kind of offers the checks and balance and protects against inflammation. People who have ESR2 variants tend to get more brain inflammation and other kinds of inflammation postmenopausally. So this particular variant is associated with increased anxiety, particularly in postmenopausal women. What could we do for this? Well, we could give her things that work on her ESR2. You can use transdermal estrogen, but actually the people with these variants don't tend to be tolerant to progesterone, which is another important thing to know. So we ended up offering her genistein or rhubarb extract because both of those have been shown to affect anxiety and affect these pathways and bind about 20 times tighter to the ESR2 pathway than the ESR1. I just realized that if you guys have um, been listening, I really tried to cover a lot tonight. And so I do wanna let you know that we have lots of educational materials where I go slower. I couldn't decide on what to present and Avi and I said that, talked about that you guys would wanna know lots of different pathways that can be affected because different people here have different interests, but know that we have lots of different options for learning if you do want to learn more. We offer three different reports. We have a medical overview that focuses on chronic illness. We have a brain optimization that covers really not only cognition in terms of Alzheimer's type related SNPs, but also stroke, ischemic brain, leukoariosis, the white matter changes. All of our products will cover what I call the functional medicine basics, the detox, the inflammation, the gut issues. And then we have our newest report, which is mental wellness. And again, please reach out to us if you want to know more about any of these in doing more training in genomics. I'll take questions in a moment, but I wanted to just kind of end with the ability to use DNA as part of clinical decision making is not the future of medicine. For all of us that are ACAM members, and I am a new ACAM member, we know that the future of medicine is now because we are all about the advancement of medicine. And genomics is the detective tool that allows you to identify root causes, but identifying them is not enough. In order to offer precision medicine, you have to be able to respond to them. And that is where genomics comes in handy. We used to have lab tests as the close we could get to personalization, but now we have thousands of more pieces of useful data to let us get at root cause and a great life. So let's see, are there questions? Well, thank you. Thank you, Sharon. We'll, we'll take questions in a second. Um, I think Katie has uh, a list of the questions as they'll, as they'll pile up. I just wanted to make a few comments first to the audience. First to the audience that when you briefly were, were able to see the actual report itself, you'll find that there's not only the relative risk and the percentage of the population that each of the individual SNPs is in. So the, the smaller the number, the smaller the prevalence in the population, actually the potentially more important each of the SNPs are. But there's also quite, quite an extraordinary amount of functional medicine proposed therapies. And I find this to be exceptionally helpful and that's something I wanted to emphasize. It, we don't have to memorize, you know, all the different treatments for all the different SNPs that are already listed there, and they're all evidence-based. So I, I think that that's been a, a spectacular advance, and I applaud Intelligence DNA for doing it. And, and the educational material we'll get into, you know, as we get more and more interested in this future is now type of mentality, right? I do want to say a few other things before we get to the questions is the concept that we're all doing labs, we're all doing bloods, urine, stool, you know, saliva, and so on. So we have to ultimately teach the population that you have to stack things, you have to stack remedies. You can't take one magic pill that everyone's looking for, even though certain ones are more important than others. We know that. But 
But to justify that, I find this tool very, very helpful. You know, not only to answer questions like, hey, how come I keep on taking more and more vitamin D and I still can't get my vitamin D level up? How come I have, no matter what I do, my heavy metals are always up? Uh, my D, you know, and then you could explain these types of phenomenon and also deal with the good news because there's not just bad news in the genomics SNP tool that the Telex DNA offers is, is also good news that you're maybe protected against certain disorders and so on. But not only that, but no matter what you need to, we all know as functional medicine doctors, we have to use anti-inflammatories, we have to use detoxifications, hormonal therapies, et cetera. And this helps you justify that. And it motivates the patients in my experience quite a lot. And I think I'm allowed to say what sort of what the cost is. I mean, the cost somewhere between $1,500 or so up, upward, depending on the, the reports, but it's not extraordinary. And, and it give, provides more information than I ever anticipated. So again, I just wanted to, everyone to, to, to know that. When I was a cardiologist at UCSF, I trained the fellows with a journal club with stacks of, of peer-reviewed articles on the value of vitamin D, K2, CoQ10, et cetera. And they never, never, never ordered them on the patients ever. Uh, there wasn't a single time that any of the cardiology fellows would actually listen to the data. But when you show it in the context of genomics, they respond and they immediately put the person on K2. So it's a remarkable tool to use in that way in terms of justification, whether it's justification to another clinician or justification to the patient. So let's get to the questions. So is it a blood test? How much does it cost? Avi kind of covered that. Is it covered by insurance? And how long does it take to get back? So those are all really great questions. So the test, it depends on what you're ordering. If the medical overview, if you were ordering just the medical overview, it would be 700. It's 900 for the brain optimization, different costs, but then the 1200 for those combined, if you order everything, it's like seven, I think it's 1700. I, you can tell I'm not the, the uh, sales department. Um, if you ordered that with mental wellness. So the cost is anywhere from 700 to 1700 if you were to order everything. It is a saliva test. You can have it sent right to your patient. The kit, a lot of people are doing telemedicine now. The lab will send it right to the patient's home with instructions. Um, it is currently taking six to eight weeks for us to get the results back. We are working on some changes that we hope eventually we'll get that down. That is something we would love to get faster, but the lab that we are using also does many, many tens of thousands of COVID testing. So this year has been a little bit slow, but the patients, if you let them know that it's going to be six or eight weeks before it's back, then usually the patients are patient. And one thing that Avi said, he was talking about that it gives you information. I was an educator by nature. I stopped counting at my 400th CME talk. So I love teaching. And so one of the things we did is we put in below all the potential interventions. So let's say you've never used genistein and you don't know what the studies were done with it, what dose were done. Um, and you're, you can go to the bottom and you can see a discussion of genistein and that the dosing was 27 milligrams twice a day. You can see that sulforaphane is better given with food, that berberine can affect 2D6 pathways. And then we also have SNPs that are benefits. So those were some of the things that Avi alluded to that are really make it kind of like a textbook of functional or integrative medicine alongside your patient's genomics to really help you so that you don't have to become an expert before using it. Once you start using it, you are the expert because nobody has this memorized and you have the resources in front of you. There's a question on, um, has there been any SNP that's been discovered or SNPs obviously that relate to, to either catching COVID or long, or, or long haul COVID? And I know that you have some, cer certain things to say about this already. Yeah, so um, we chose not to do a formal COVID report for a variety of reasons, because we felt like, you know, there wasn't enough research to kind of say, okay, well, we want to do a whole COVID report. But what we did do is comb the research for studies already out there that related to COVID response. So there was a lot of speculation, could the, and we have like the ACE insertions, the ACE2 genes, 
but we felt like there wasn't enough research to say, yes, this makes you at more risk or less risk because this particular COVID virus, the spike proteins were so aggressive or the virus was so aggressive, we felt everybody should be considering themselves at risk. But what we did look into is SNPs like NLRP3, which is your inflammation response, the inflammasomes, or CCL2, which is the cytokine 2, it relates to interleukin 2 or cytokines, chemokine 2. And those are both associated with a much greater risk of acute respiratory distress syndrome. Interestingly, the CXCL2 that relates to chemokine 2, also it can be affected by things like andrographis, things like astragalus, things like sambucus, which of course we all know have great studies coming out for COVID. And then NLRP3 can be affected. If you can't stop inflammation, that can be affected by things that regulate inflammasomes like resolvins. And again, there are published papers showing resolvins can help with acute respiratory distress, including even in COVID. So we kind of help our patients go, gosh, you know, you are at higher risk for getting lung inflammation if you get it. Let's make sure you know to be aggressive with taking these at the first sign. That was a great answer. Thank you. We've had a few patients with long COVID and, and your reports have been illuminating in terms of the average person that we see that's acutely ill uh, or, or chronic, acute on chronically ill. Uh, they come in sometimes with two entire Excel spreadsheets, pages full of uh, supplements, and they're all intelligent. They're quite, they have an intelligence behind every single one but I, I find that this type of report helps produce a hierarchy mm -hmm. in terms of fundamental strengths and weaknesses of a person you could take advantage of or, or a need to replace more aggressively. Yes. Yeah. And then the question goes, how many genes or SNPs are tested and is this an Illumina array? So people always ask that question. We actually chose not to use an Illumina array partially because that technology has certain concerns with it and that the Illumina array, every technology has its own concerns, but there were certain concerns with regards to the reproducibility of the Illumina array and how that could affect the accuracy of something being used for medical decision-making. It's an Affymetrics array. Even the Affymetrics array has certain SNPs that don't perform well. So it's the part of the cost is we additionally use PCR to get at SNPs that don't perform with high accuracy. And that's really important because if you ever open up a 23andMe report, you'll notice they don't report on ApoE2. Well, that's because ApoE2 is one of those genes that can't be gotten at accurately. In fact, from what we've looked at with our validation studies, kind of looking at where that was at, array technology is only about 65% accurate whether it's Illumina or uh, Affymetrix array for ApoE2. So when your patient is paying for an Intellix DNA test, they're getting the large number of SNPs. That's what array technology is good for, getting a large number of SNPs, but they're also getting validation with a second test for the SNPs that weren't performing accurately. And then there's something called um, deletions, which is when a whole gene is a null. So glutathione uh, transferases, which are really important for those of us doing environmental medicine and detox. The GSTT1 and the GSTM1 can be completely absent in an individual. So we also do deletion assays for that. In terms of the number of genes, well, there are over 250,000 SNPs or on our array. We don't show you all of those because we're only gonna show you the ones that we've had time to research, know what they do and know how to intervene and curate them. But we do have a research tool that you can get at another 10 or 20,000 of. It's really not about the number, it's about what genes are clinically important. And we've spent thousands and thousands of hours going through literally over 100,000 gene variants to say which ones are the most important to a physician. And those are the ones that we show. And the, the, to reiterate that, I mean, I remember the first report we, we received from you was probably 50 some odd pages and the latest one was 117 pages. So you're working all the time, I think on creating new data, but it's always related to some form of an action. I, we haven't had any patient where there was no action based on the results. So I think that that was one thing I wanted to mention. There's a question about specifics about training. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you reiterate exactly how someone could 
get into the website yes. and into the so training. If you are interested, just reach out. You can either go to our website and click on the clinician and then go to info, or you can go info at Intellix DNA. It's two L's, two X's like for an intelligent approach to DNA and then DNA. And we have a very advanced training program with dozens of hours of training. We now have what we call Genomic University, where you can study on your own and then participate in live events with me. So it's a go at your own pace training. The training is a very nominal cost. Whenever we're doing it for an organization like this, we give 75% off the training. So it ends up being a few hundred dollars when you purchase your first report to have access to all of the training. And in addition to that, we walk you through your first three reports because we realize that what you need when you're learning a new technology is you need that kind of the training wheels. So uh, one of those walkthroughs is with me and two of them are with my head research associate so that when you get the report back, we can kind of help you. We have lots of case studies. We have uh, an IO group and things as well. But we help you by walking you through some of the cases to kind of get you just comfortable. Once you've done two or three reports, you're going to find that it comes naturally, but it, it is nice to have support. We also have webinars of how to organize a report, how to get ready for a consult so that you don't feel like you have to learn it all because that's the whole point of this tool. And we purposely did not put screenshots of our tool in this since this is going to be on a public website. But we would be happy to schedule a personalized tour. A woman named Ling Wu on our team is the main person who does this. And she will show you a tour based on your interest of the different parts of the report and how it actually works. Because it gives a lot more information, like Avi said, in terms of typical dosing, really a lot of information about the gene, the gene function. We have kind of the basic key point for when you're starting, like CompT makes it harder, take three to four times longer to break down adrenaline. This can increase stress levels. But then we have all the different things that in the literature it's been associated with and kind of deeper dive for when you're ready for it. So it's a tool that lets you grow your genomic knowledge as you use it. And as you can tell, I love teaching. And so we have lots of opportunities for you to learn. Is there an optimal age you recommend a patient look into their genomics? Uh, uh, since symptoms change over time, how soon can you get started? I think we all sort of know what the answer is going to be, but why don't you articulate yeah. it? Well, we actually, it might surprise you a little. We don't recommend generally the whole executive report for a young adult or a child, but we do use our, we call it mental wellness. We didn't want to call it mental health because it's not about, you have to wait till they're feeling crazy or depressed or anxious or have OCD. But for children, our mental wellness report also has all the nutrigenomics it has all of the gut microbiome stuff that's, you know, are you gluten likely to be at risk for gluten intolerance, histamine intolerance, lactose intolerance. It has all of the detox stuff, all of the different, um, you know, pathways of zinc and B6 and B12. And we've actually had some great cases where somebody's come with ADHD and we look at their ADHD panel and they really don't have much, but then we look at their magnesium panel, their B6 panel, their B12 panel, their vitamin D panel, and all of those building blocks that are needed for serotonin, that are needed for norepinephrine, that are needed for dopamine are affected and we've had great results. So we use our mental wellness for children. We do have an autism add-on that is still in what we call alpha, meaning we kind of let people into that group if they are experienced in autism world. We're not really selling it yet to the general public because that will be launched this coming September but we are selling it to people who are qualified users now. But the mental wellness is what I would say for younger people. And then yes, the executive report, the brain optimization or what we call the powerhouses, which is what Avi is using in his practice that gives everything for any age. In my practice, most of my patients under 75, I would say 95% of my patients under 75 have chosen to do their genomics. Sometimes my seniors are like, you know, I think I already know what's going on with me, but um, it, it just depends. I have some seniors who have and some who haven't, but I think that if you were to talk to Carol, uh, our co-founder, she would tell you that our vision is that we change the future of healthcare and that eventually we get this to the point that when you have a child, you could have this information and know more about how do you optimally feed and water this child, so... Well, that's that's a that's a good last point. There's an anonymous attendee that also uh, sort of was voicing her frustration with the, the classical medical system uh, with specific 
recommendations for foods and so on, supplements during cancer treatments. And this is not a genomic study for cancer specific tissue based studies. You know, this is all the risk factors that you would be able to understand and deal with relative to your risk and why you developed cancer over time, obviously. And she's ultimately asking, um, how, when do you think that this, our genomics studies like this will be commonplace and will ultimately be covered by insurance? Perhaps you would have the best ability to answer that question. Yeah, so the, in order for something to be covered by insurance, you have to first have a number of studies that you can take to basically get this approved as more of a formal, right now it's what's called a clinical decision support tool. So it is a tool that doctors can use, but it's not approved as a formal standardized lab test. Now there has never been a tool like our tool. So the process to get it approved as a formal lab test is a little bit of a black hole. But what we do know is that we have to have a number of published studies showing outcomes data. We're really excited to say that our first two studies are um, getting published soon. One is with Dr. Bredesen, Dale Bredesen, who I'm sure that most of you um, have heard of, who as the uh, author of End of Alzheimer's and the head of uh, Apollo Health and Recode. Um, and he and his colleagues have been using our genomics as part of a reversal of cognitive impairment study that's going to be published soon. Um, we also have an autism study that is pending publication and so after we have, it's probably, I would say, not going to be anytime soon before you're going to be able to have it filed for insurance. We do have people use their different funds that they get, the health savings accounts, because you're still ordering it. And what we tell our patients, though, and what we tell our doctors is, for the doctors, you don't have to sell genomics. Just offer it to the patients, because if a patient set knows that they can find out more information about their brain health how to keep them from getting cognitive decline, how to keep them from getting diabetes or to reverse early diabetes or you know, improve their cardiac function. We even have things like de identifying melanoma risk that they can kind of lower their risk then because they can kind of match it. All these different pathways, things that affect their response to anesthesia, you just tell the patient or refer them to, there was an interview with Dr. Carnahan to, that's kind of patient geared let them learn about the tool and give them the option. And I think that that's where we're at right now. And then we actually encourage our users to send us their case studies and we help our users publish their case studies, um, which will then put us in a position to then do the double line placebo control, which will then allow us to uh, eventually become a lab test, but it's still a little while off. Thank you really very much, Sharon. Um, it's extraordinary presentation and, uh, and your experience is a great ideal for us to look at. And you're so generous with your time. And I know that you've taken, I've taken a lot of your time in the past, but now I'm really comfortable with the reports and everyone in, in the audience can feel that way fairly quickly. So thank you very much. Uh, we're, we are out of time. Thank you, ACAM. Thank you, Katie, for organizing. Thank you, uh, everyone in Intellix DNA for doing the, the all the all the all the and hard work. Please, please reach out. We actually are delighted to show you what we're doing, and so you can decide if it's right for you and your practice. Great. Thank you. Okay. Bye.